So welcome again. My name is Amanda Weber. Um, if we haven't met, I'm the Minister of Music and the Arts at Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis. And uh, so glad that you're here. Glad that we've got this um, really wonderful opportunity to learn from some of our uh, fantastic colleagues here in the Twin Cities. Um, and this evening, we welcome back Yolanda Williams, who was with us last week to get things started. Uh, Dr. Williams is an educator, a performing musician, and most recently a pastor as well, has just today, I think, moved into a new home or parsonage. Uh, so really excited that you've made time amongst your boxes to sit with us for an hour. Uh, so I'll just request from the group that you mute yourself if you haven't already, um, or I can kind of help with that on my end. And um, you're welcome to be on video or off video. It's always, I think, nice for speakers to have kind of a live audience, but uh, do what you need to do. And I'll hand it over to you, Yolanda. Great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just moved into my parsonage in Glenwood, Minnesota. It's about, um, it's north, um, south of Alexandria on a beautiful Lake Minnewaska. So um, I am enjoying um, really horrible temperatures, just like the rest of Minneapolis, and probably in increased because I'm so near to water. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm really happy to be with you this evening. Um, so let me get to the right to the there we go right to the screen share. I want to start with asking if anybody who didn't, we're going to prioritize people who didn't speak last time, if there's anybody who had something that came up um, in their minds over the week after hearing the first session, um, or some things that came up as you were listening to music this week that you'd like to ask a question about or make a comment. So I'm going to prioritize people who didn't speak last week. But if you have something that you'd like to bring up, let's take a couple minutes to do that. All right. Everybody's got it. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So let me start with um, just a brief overview of what we talked about last week. So we have our head in the dialogue and we have our head in the information and we have the vocabulary already in our minds. So remember last week, we wanted to remind us, uh, us all that Africa is a continent, not a country, that because it's a continent, there's immense variety in the melodies. Some use pentatonic scales, some use five, uh, eight note scales, some use 12 note scales. Some of the scales have microtone, uh, uh, quarter tones, something that's smaller than a half step, that harmonies can be done. Uh, with multiple primary melodies. They can be improvisations on one primary melody. Um, that, of course, we have a lot of instrumentation, uh, but lots of variety of song form, not just your verse chorus uh, kind of a thing, or the pop song format. And then there's a lot of performance practices. So it's really difficult when you talk about what is African music because of the uh, immense variety of the music and of the country itself. So we also talked about last week as part of our uh, conclusions that the diaspora is also complex because Africans were and are in Europe, Asia, and in the Americas, and that there is some syncretization, which is when you bring together two disparate things to create a third thing. Um, in, in French or in, at least in Louisiana and some of those places, they call it a patois. So a roux, something that where you've put a lot of things together and you create something very delicious. Um, and those synchronizations come from native people. So of course the Caribs um, were involved in creating the music that we hear in Trinidad and Tobago and, and in the islands, not just the Africans, the Africans and of course Europeans and the European 
uh, expression is also very uh, is also varied because we have Portuguese and we have French and we have Italian and all those kinds of things. It's also different and difficult to put a handle on it because at the same time that we're focused all the time in the United States, I think, about the enslavement of Africans, there's also a large population of free Africans that were affecting music, that were composing, that were performing. And so I want to make sure that when we talk about a diaspora, that we don't just focus on African people's primary influences as victims of enslavement, because they also came into those places as explorers and in, influenced those, um, the music and the performance practices outside of enslavement. Then I talked about the fact that there's going to be some impacts on how you're going to be able to hear the, hear the soul. And part of that is the synchronization. How do we separate out what is European, what is native, what is African, and what is just because you're in a certain region in the United States. Um, there's a huge pressure on the African uh, in the United States to either preserve their culture or to assimilate. And what we find is that kind of moved along uh, class lines in the United States. If you were part of the free African class, there was more assimilation to European styles and European use of European musical attributes. Whereas if you were, if you were enslaved or impoverished or other disenfranchised, there was going to be more of a push for you to preserve uh, your Africanisms, as we call that. And it makes sense because that would be your survival. That would be your lineage. That would be the way that you identify and preserve your place in the lineage of African. There's also commodification, and we talk about that making money, that of course, part of enslavement, in fact, the major part of enslavement is about commodification, putting a price on a human being. But it also then in music starts to become putting a, putting a price on one's talent, one's skills, and one's intellectual property. So if someone is uh, producing compositions that is making money for someone else, then of course that is going to be something that is going to be valued and it's going to be encouraged. We talked about the fact that in many of the cultures on the African continent, there is no big break between what is sacred and what is secular, that they somewhat are interchangeable, and that we see that sometimes in, um, in some of our United States music, whereas the blues is one side of the coin of gospel music, because when Thomas Dorsey had his idea about creating something that was sacred, but had the kind of earthiness and relevancy that people who were burdened could understand and could latch on to, he turned to the blues. And of course, he had been a church musician, then became a blues musician, writing down compositions for Ma Rainey even as Georgia Tom, and making a lot of money as a blues musician, and then going back to being um, a gospel musician. I kind of think of um, Al Green and even Little Richard in those same kind of lines because they tended to go back and forth um, because of the struggle that Europeans placed on secular music as being demonic. And so if you're constantly hearing this message that if you're singing about the earthy things, the worldly things, that you are close to the devil, then there's going to be some kind of stressor uh, for you to want to keep things European pure, pure rather than African pure. We also talked a little bit about the fact that having these major categorizations of music, whether it's art music, so it's just created for the sake of intellectual and artistic endeavors. Folk music, music of the people, we often don't know who the composers are, and it's very flexible. It doesn't belong to anyone, it belongs to everyone. And pop music created just so that it can make some money. 
that when you have these interacting in choral music, um, it makes sense, for example, why some groups are going to take songs like Lord, lift me up where you lift me up where you belong, and that's not really the song because it comes from Pop, Gamp, Pop Gun. But we're going to change the lyrics slightly because that's a pop song, and now I'm going to blur the line between sacred and secular, and I'm going to use it in church. Um, I remember when uh, Kirk Franklin came out with his songs um, that there was a song called Stomp. And I remember a pastor saying, I was at this worship service and, a pa and the pastor said, uh, the children are gonna present stomp here. And, and I know that this is not really a Christian song. It really is, but it doesn't sound Christian. Um, and, and I'm gonna let them do that as long as they, you know, remember they're in church. <laughs> and I was just sitting there cracking up because uh, the song is really about using your body to praise God and how, and from the Old Testament, using your body to praise God is part of temple worship. But because we've gotten to this place where we have to have these strong lines between genres and strong lines between sacred and secular, it gets to be confusing for everyone. Uh, we talked about some vocabulary that in many of the musics on the continent of Africa, there is no bad sound. So whether this voice is nasal or husky, all are accepted. Uh, and we've even listened to a song where the vocalists move from nasal to husky in the same performance so that those timbral changes are acceptable. We talked about the fact that everybody participates, even though there is a class a cast of professional musicians that everyone is expected to participate in the ways that you can participate is through call and response or through echo. We talked about the fact that music and song does not occur in isolation on the continent. Uh, the fact that um, in over 700 languages, there is no specific word for song or music. So it's completely, completely embedded in society. Uh, we talked about a performance of a cyclical performance that has an underlying timeline. And we talked about prioritizing improvisation, keeping in mind that improvisation is not a free for all because it is an agreed upon musical conversation. Uh, we have agreed on the topic, which might be the key. We've agreed upon the tempo. Uh, we've agreed upon who's going to take ta turns. Uh, so it's not just everybody just plays whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, as I've had many conversations recently about the meaning of freedom coming up on July 4th, um, I reminded people that freedom doesn't mean that you get to do what you want. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to think, I can't wait to become an adult because when I become an adult, I'll get to do what I want. And I'll tell you, it's my greatest chagrin when I became older and realized that nobody gets to do what they want all the time. There's always somebody who is going to be impacting whether you can or cannot do something. And that's probably a good thing because just think of how out of control we would be. I mean, not me, but maybe somebody would be out of control. So I want to talk about then moving from the continent to colonial and as fast as I can get us up to uh, past emancipation because I'm imagining my colleagues are going to talk about a lot of the modern stuff. So I'm not going to talk about a lot of modern stuff in my, I'm just trying to get you ready to hear the soul as it's being presented by the others. So we have to keep in mind that both free and enslaved Africans um, participated as performers of music, choral music, composers of choral music, as choral conductors, as vocal coaches, and then as educators, uh, teaching those nuts and bolts kinds of things of how to compose and how to correctly sing. That when we use the techniques that they were focusing on, let me, I'm sorry about that, uh, were things like ululation. And remember we talked about ululation as being vocal sounds that have no words or syllables attached. So screams, moans, that 
that's a ululation because it has nothing to do with the word. Whereas a vocable has to do with nonsense words or syllables like so we think about scat a lot of times. Or when we think about groups like um, uh, Gladys Knight and the Pips, the kinds of sounds that the Pips are making to um, be the instrumentation, that's what we think about for vocables. We talk about portamento, which is something that, of course, you know, every European choir I've been in has really hammered on hitting the pitch right on, not sliding up to it and not sliding down to it. So if you're going to sing something that's going to be in a folk or pop tradition, you're going to have to learn to slide in and to slide out. Uh, we talk about coloratura as those movements or those pitches around, uh, those vocal acrobatics. Melisma as taking a syllable of a word and placing it over several tones, which is in all music. I mean, Handel, we would not have Handel's Messiah without melisma because there's tons of that. We talked about tambour changes and we talked about range, the fact that in um, the African American tradition of choral singing, and in fact, in gospel choirs, the tenors tend to sing higher than the altos. Um, there's, there tends to be a, a really shift. And that's why it sounds so different to us because first of all, you have the fact that they're singing higher pitches and not singing it as part of a falsetto, singing it full voice. And also the fact that you have the timbre, they're singing in uh, more of a nasal sound. And then the altos are singing in the really husky sound. So there's that shift and that's where we get that. There are other things, but I'm sure other people will cover those when they talk about gospel choral music. So there's two last things I wanna bring up and then we can jump in. Um, one is the lyrical technique of signifying, not signifying, but signifying. And this signifying is, comes in lots of different ways. One, it can be boasting and bragging. It can be stories um, that talk about brain over brawn. And we get both of those in um, the, the story, the fable of the signifying monkey. Um, this is the monkey who's been rattling the cage of, in the jungle of a lion, knowing that he cannot defeat the lion. And when the lion finally calls him out, he decides that he's going to go to the elephant and tell the elephant that the lion has been talking about him so that he stirs up an argument between the lion and the elephant. And once the lion gets beat up by the elephant, he comes back to the jungle to see the signifying monkey there with his next range of uh, language. We also have that in the stories of the 1920s of a man who was called Simple. Um, there's just a whole line of these stories. Um, and usually, Simple is the person who everyone thinks is stupid but he has the most profound grasp of life and can settle any, uh, any, any argument with just a word because he, instead of bragging about his intelligence, he sits back and then he pulls it out when it's necessary. So you can see if we're in um, an enslavement institution called the United States, why it would be important for a person to not let you know their intellect level. Because if you are not supposed to be able to read and write, but you show some intelligence, that might be very dangerous for you. So using signifying to talk around the topic and to wordsmith things uh, is something we find very typical. And of course, now um, hip hop would be nothing without signifying. Uh, double entendre, this French phrase, which means double heard, which really means that I'm going to say something that has a non-controversial meaning for people outside of my community and a controversial meaning for people inside of my community. So you can imagine, again, that if I'm in a situation where my knowledge of things uh, may cause myself, cause me to be in danger, but I want the information to get out. 
that I'm going to find a way to communicate the information to my community, but make it sound like I'm not really talking, I'm talking nonsense to other people. Um, some people call this coding, and there are some specific codes that were used in uh, vocal music. Uh, for example, using the name Hannah uh, as the sun. So you can't really sing a song about how I'm tired and I wish I could go home because someone might just beat you. But you can say, I wish Hannah would go home. And what you're saying is, I wish the sun would go down. And so it has a non-controversial meaning. In prison, it was often a very difficult time to, a uh, difficult place to have any human being who might be close to you. So if you had a woman that you loved, then people could use that against you somehow. So using the standard term of Rosie, no one would really know who you're in love with or who your girlfriend is or who your wife is. And so this is a code using Rosie. There's also in throughout the blues, lots of double entendre. And the, the one that comes to mind is um, Alberta Hunter's Handyman. She sings a song about a man who can turn down her damper and bring up her fire, who brings home the meat, all these different things that sound like they could really just be good things that a person does, or they can sound like they're really sexual things. And those songs leave it up to the listener to decide if it's a sexual thing or if it's a non-sexual thing, because then that's really about your problem than about my, my uh, sexuality. So as we talk about the colonial through emancipation, we're still at the point where we're talking about group singing. We don't have a lot of formal choirs in the United States or as the colonies. And I'm gonna focus most of my talk on secular because most people, when they talk about African-American choral music, they're gonna jump quickly to the spirituals and that's where it begins and ends. And I wanna give, give you another perspective. So what drove the music of the African-American through the colonial period and post and post emancipation is the fact that it was recognized that the African skills, talents, and intellectual property were very valuable. They could make money. And if I am your, if you are indentured to me, or if you are my, uh, if I have enslaved you, then I can make additional money off of you by giving by renting you out to other places. Uh, by taking your intellectual property and putting my name on it. And so what came out of this industry was that they became approved skills that Africans could have. So yes, you could have labor skills, agrarian skills. Uh, in fact, you know, there's certain countries that were particularly, um, people were particularly enslaved from because they had skills in uh, with horses or with growing rice. Uh, craftsmanship, so if you uh, were, could build cabinets or if you could build houses, that was a skill that was, and these skills were not only okay, but they often were developed. People, the masters or mistresses or heads of households would pay to develop those skills in you because it would turn a profit. I already talked about horsemanship. The one that I think nobody really recognizes um, that I think we've recognized in maybe the last 15 years, but math skills were highly valued among Africans because then they could, they could, work, um, they could work at, go down to the, um, to the mill, they could drop off their things and they could keep accurate books of the things that they're selling and make sure that um, the person would get their money. And then of course, music was one of those skills, talents and intellectual property that was highly valued. And most people don't know this, but it was not just uh, free Africans that were acting as musicians and teachers, but enslaved Africans also were teaching. 
and coming into homes and providing private lessons on the piano, on the flute, and believe it or not, on the French horn of all things. We know this because of the extensive work of Aline Southern for one, uh, Antoinette uh, Southern for two, and also we can find this information in runaway slave ads because the skills that distinguished these Africans and made them valuable also became the identifiers when they escaped. And now because of the internet, you can actually go through databases of runaway slave ads and you can see this person has a fine voice as a tenor. This person plays a, a really nice flute. This person is a great violinist. This person is a great French horn player. Uh, so we know these things. So the themes that we're gonna find in the music of this period are of course the Bible stories with commentary. And this, the spiritual I brought up was uh, from I Got a Robe, You Got a Robe. Most people sing that so joyfully and then they completely skip over the line in their minds, I think. They sing it, but I don't think they hear this line saying, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. So the next time you sing, I got a robe, you got a robe, all God's children got a robe. When I get to heaven, going to walk all around, going to put on my crowd. Then they have this line here. So there's always a commentary. And that's one of those double entendre kind of things. I can slip in this commentary because people have already then be, been lulled by the rest of the song, the fact that it has this cool, cool beat to it. Um, a lot of their songs were folk stories and legends, some from the continent of Africa, some developed here like John Henry, the steel driving man. Um, some of them were pseudo historical. So we know that there was a man named Stag Lee who did murder someone, but the story is sketchy. And so it's pseudo historical that we have this song. We also have animal stories and morality stories that have very close um, parallels to stories from the continent. We of course have songs and language about enslavement and the anti-slavery about abolitionist movement. Lots of music about traveling, whether it's train or boat or walking. And then of course you have music that's about occupations. Feel free to stop me if you want to. During emancipation, believe it or not, there's a lot of music that's about the Civil War, um, composed and sung by African Americans. And remember that one of the secular things of singing together is to raise money for the war. And so these types of glee clubs would get together um, and often the glee club came out of a troop and they would sing for Sunday dinners and after church so they could raise money for the war effort. And of course, singing as they marched and singing, of course, around the camp. On the opposite end of that, we have songs during um, the emancipation uh, period, which is the Civil War, uh, talking about contraband. Contraband is what Africans who had escaped from plantations were called by the Union soldiers. And so they, be, they were not treated as prisoners of war uh, with that designation, but they were put in camps as if they were prisoners of war. And so there are lots of songs that are around that topic. After emancipation, of course, we have all kinds of different problems that come up. So we have the songs around the person named Joe Turney, or you might have heard of August Wilson's play, Joe Turner's Blues, Joe Turner Has Come and Gone. And this talks about the fact that prison becomes the next enslavement right alongside of um, sharecropping. And Joe Turney was a man who had contracts with some of the uh, superintendents of prisons like Parchman. He would go through town, he would see a group of black men loitering, as they wanted to call it. Um, he would, they had rules back then, 
uh, that you had to have a certain amount of money in your pocket on demand or you were considered indigent and indigency was a crime and you could immediately be taken to jail. Now, remember this is before we get our Miranda Acts, this is before you get any protections. So these men basically disappeared from neighborhoods and from cities, not ending up in jail, but ending up in prison where they would put to hard labor. And so the Joe Turner blues talks about um, Joe Turner come to town and he carries with him 50 links of chain and a man for every one. Um, we also have the songs about alcoholism. So we don't see songs about alcoholism until after emancipation. And then we also see songs about infidelity. Um, man, uh, a man cheating on his wife, the wife cheating on the husband. And we also, by the 1920s, start adding in uh, infidelity between same sex. We also hear about taxes. So believe it or not, there are songs out there that talk about taxes. <laughs> so when we talk about then the choral music that's going to come out of this period, um, and remember, I'm not going to talk that much about sacred, but I'll give you a quick little overview, uh, that the worship music has hymns, which is course, congregational singing, anthems for a small group. Uh, usually they call them ensembles. They didn't always call them church choirs So a little later. Responsorial singing, so someone speaks and people sing back. Shape note you might have heard about um, came um, about after people decided that people were singing uh, church hymns incorrectly. They were scooping and sliding around and changing the melody to their own flavor. We can't have that. So we better teach them how to read music so that they can sing properly. And some people say that part of that is the African influence in the way hymns were singing. And part of that was the folk influence because the folk influence did not have to approach pitch right on top. It's the Western art music that's all of a sudden coming into church music that's saying you have to sing church music a certain way. Uh, camp meeting songs, these little ditties that were written so that if you're itinerant, you can learn the song uh, after one hearing. And so that's gonna have a lot of repetition in it. Two things, three things that I think aren't thought about a lot with community singing is preaching, because Black preaching is singing. And believe it or not, there are a lot of recorder, recordings that were done of Black preachers because of their sing-songy uh, style. There's a style of African-American singing that's just called moaning, and we're going to listen to some of that. And then both the Europeans and the Africans participated in what is called lined out hymns. So a lined out hymn is basically a way of teaching someone the hymn by singing a line before you sing it. And even to this day, if you go to some of the traditional black churches, you will hear lined out hymns because you have to consider that maybe we don't have a whole lot of hymnals or we have children that don't read. And so what's the best, fastest way as a community that we can learn a song? By me singing it and then you singing it, you singing the line. And then I sing the next line and you sing until we get through the entire song. So some examples here. So line singing, um, and this is uh, my last slide I have where you can find these. You can still get these. In fact, you can download MP3s if, if you have a fancy for them. Um, this is line singing, A Charge to Keep. So A Charge to Keep, Have I, is an Isaac Watts hymn. And for some reason, the Isaac Watts hymns, because of their rhythmic context and the personalization of lyrics, really became popular among African-American communities. And so, but you, if you know that song, this is not going to sound anything like it. So it uses heterophonic texture. Remember I talked about heterophonic textures when there is a melody, but you have permission 
to move off the melody because of it, because we're prioritizing improvisation. As long as you don't destroy completely the integrity of the original melody. All right, so let's see if this is gonna work. Let me know if you can't hear. But we know now this service will not be completed yes. unless and we can hear from Dr. Watts. Yes. And this short meter him, a charge to keep our half, yes. a God to glorify, yes. a never dying soul to save, and fitted for the sky, a charge. stop there so fascinating harmonies here right um they you hear a little bit of a drone everyone's moving in a parallel motion but there's something that's so bittersweet remember we talked about that bittersweetness of the music of um of, that came from the continent in the diaspora um i want to look here there's some some notes here and i want to respond really quickly to the chats before I move on to the next example. So, um, let's see. Shape note singing was, um, I think it was the first great awakening uh, when it was decided that four major shapes would form the fa, sol, la. Yes, I think it's three, fa, sol, la and that everyone would learn basically how to harmonize and sing melodies based on reading pitches. It expanded beyond that to become eight note shape singing, but it started off with but just fossil law. Okay, I think, I think that covers it, yeah? Uh, I think it, part of the question there, I think was, um, it, uh, you were describe you were talking about uh, the, the importance from like the singing schools to say like this is the right way to sing and that maybe that um that some people viewed that as like a, a counter to the african culture that was maybe scooping or doing more of this kind of heterophonic singing mm -hmm. um but yeah a couple of us were just remarking that's really interesting because i think the shape note singing that we've encountered today is like really imperfect singing and it's like embracing a non-western tradition uh, or like non-art music, kind of the way we think of, of perfect mm -hmm. today. And and it is like nasal and raspy and scoopy and all these things. So it, I don't know if that's just the way that has evolved over time. I think that um, like everything else, you try to kill something off and all you do is embed it. So as they're, they're trying to force people to sing in this really straight tone and uh, to, to hit the pitches. I think they couldn't really kill it off because every time a new group of immigrants came, because I don't know if you've ever heard um, Irish church singing, folk singing, it's very scoopy, very scoopy, very kind of like this drawn out. Um, and it's very, it's very personal and no one seems to have a problem with the fact that there's so many timbres going on at the same time. And so I think that's what happened. And the fact that you had um, some of these um, singers from the African tradition who were actually teaching the shape note. In fact, the shape note tradition, the eight note shape, shape note tradition still continues in the South and it's used primarily as community singing and as competition. 
Hmm. And it's not about the technique. It's about being able to read the pitches. Mm -hmm. So you're not, it's not about your timbre or your technique. It's about being able to read pitch. Yeah. And then I think there was a, one previous question related to Native American uh, community. Phil, I don't know if you want to ask that aloud where that was a little earlier in the talk. You're on mute there. Sorry. Yeah, my question, I know the, just a little bit about the interactions, particularly like in New Orleans mm -hmm. between the slave, enslaved communities and the um, Choctaw and other tribes that actually gave sanctuary to runaway slaves. And I'm wondering, because of some of this interaction, um, how that may have possibly shaped some of the music. I think um, from my reading that most found, um, Indians found, the native First Nations people found that they had a kindred spirit in the African and the African also found that they had a kindred spirit. So throughout the country, uh, they were intermarrying and um, even though we call them Maroons when we're in the Caribbean, we could call them Maroons here, uh, escaped slaves who integrate into native communities. The problem is that it's hard to separate that out because when people like Frances Dinsmore decided to do her ethnography of native music, they wrote it down in Western language. And so it's very difficult to know what the true native sound sounded like, because once you start putting it on, you know, five lines and four spaces, it's not going to sound at all like it was. But I think whenever, when, if you've ever heard, um, at least up here, uh, the powwow singing, and if you've ever heard, um, as you were talking about the uh, native, what are they called? Uh, Mardi Gras Indians of New Orleans, that there's something about the technique. But I, and I, don't think that, I don't think the technique is uniquely African. I think it is uniquely traditional. It is uniquely cultural. People, you know, without using the word primitive to be something negative, it is something that is real down home. And everything else that has removed that is what, what has been the effect of bringing in the Western art influence. And so I think it's interesting because pop music tries to be on the fence between two things. They want you to sing in tune, or at least use an auto-tune so you sing in tune, but then we also want you to sing as if you're completely unrehearsed. Kind of reminds me of Frank Sinatra, who most people don't know, never uh, improvised anything. Everything was completely, completely rehearsed, even his mistakes. But people enjoy that interaction because that is what's considered a more authentic interaction with music. Um, kind of got off track. Does that make sense? All right. All right. So let, let's listen to the other example. Let me close this up, which is just a traditional prayer. So this is the Lord's Prayer, but it's prayed with moans. Again, you have that great, uh, I think there are parallel forts um, that are continuing through there and it gives it a really, really different kind of a sound. 
Uh, the fact that they're bending those pitches gives us uh, the blue notes that we were talking about. And, uh, oh, someone lost sound? Did everybody lose sound? Okay, just a couple people, some people. All right, sorry about that. So um, it's a YouTube, so you'll be okay. Uh, you'll be okay. But we know now this service will not be complete. So I want to move on. We're running out of time. So the secular music um, we talked about already with these lists, and I just want to play you some examples. I want to play you uh, something from military work song and something from children's games. And I'm sorry I'm zooming here, zooming on Zoom to get through this. We'll skip that. So when we talk about work songs, we're talking about um, several categories. So the field hollers are unique to the African, the African tradition in on the plantation. And there's whale, um, and usually it would be more of a polyphonic sound because everyone would have their own melody and no one's really worried about trying to make them match. So something like, oh Lord, I'm tired. So, so, so tired. And everyone's singing those things, adding what they want. Uh, in the urban areas and on the docks, you'll have vendor songs, people who are selling blackberries, blackberries. Uh, and it was said that people who had the best songs actually sold the best, sold most products. So the double reason to make sure that that song is good. And then of course, from moving from the plantation then to singing the same songs in the chain game. So I have, let's see if I can skip out of this and go to um, an example of something of a work song here. Up on the rail, up on the tower, up on the rail, up on the rail, up on the rail, a lot of men have got hurt. Hallelujah. Oh, tell my buddy. This is the blues that grew up in the. All right. Uh, let's see. Get back here to. Um, so another thing that I think a lot of people forget is that our kids are always very active and our kids participate in a lot of community singing uh, and a lot of improvisation. And um, the Georgia Sea Islands was a place that was discovered to have housed a lot of the traditions of Sierra Leone. And um, so this song comes from uh, the Georgia Sea Islands and it's called Mama Lama Kumalana. So I hope that what you can see by all that is that there are threads of Africanisms that persist uh, throughout the colonial period, the pre and the during and the post emancipation period. And the same kinds of things that we were talking about with echoing and call and response and coding, um, I think you're gonna hear in all your other music. What I hope that you will take away from this is that this large variety 
of techniques that have come from the African continent are things that we still can enjoy in the same ways that we can enjoy the French influences and in United States music, the German influences, the Swede, the Norwegian, all those influences. And all of those basically came together at a particular time to create what we now call America's music, the music of the United States. But if they hadn't had that African influence, I really think that what would have been called America's music would have been very different. And uh, I think not have as much um, of the personal touch because the Europeans were far, were really trying to influence everything with the art music and the African basically gave them permission, I think gave them permission to honor their folk roots. So let me ask if there are any questions here, because I see that I'm running out as usual. Any questions, comments? What was your favorite song, anybody? <laughs> Such a quiet bunch. Such a quiet bunch. Well, I was when I was listening to the kids, I was trying to remember all the hand clap movements. Yep. And I think that's one of the things you didn't mention, but there are a lot of motions and movements with a lot of these. Right. And that goes back to that first lecture where I talked about how music um, is not by itself. So music, spoken word, dance, costumes, hand motions, they always go together. I have a friend who is a uh, uh, an educator at the University of Minnesota, and she tells me every time she goes home to Ghana, there are about 50 new songs that the kids have, and 50 new games that the kids have come up with. So sometimes I think that we, in our American educational system, are the ones that are destroying the possibility of what music could be, uh, because we always want them to do it the right way. We want people to sing within the lines, the same way we want them to color in the lines. And what would school be like? What would music in America be like if everyone was encouraged to not worry about having a bad sound, to not worry about uh, whether you are trained or untrained as a musician, but to say everybody gets to participate and everybody's participation is of equal value. And I think that's what um, the African tradition brings into this conversation. There's a comment there about the our father from Kelly. And uh, here I can actually talk. Sorry, you can't see me. <laughs> but no, it's it's it was beautiful. But you know, at first you would just listen with maybe classically trained ears and go, mm -hmm. "Oh, this is so unusual." And is this appropriate? Uh, so it sounds like a lot. You know, a lot of chords that aren't lining up, and you think it really doesn't matter. I mean, it sounds like a lot of people, like you said, I love that all voices are included. And that's, I think the such an important th thing about singing is it doesn't matter if you have a perfect voice, just put it out there. Mm -hmm. And I love that it just embraces everyone and everyone's natural voice. I think that's beautiful. So that was just a really interesting way. Plus to support that kind of sung spoken prayer was so neat. We should try that in choir sometime. Yeah, <laughs> we should. True, I always think that that's probably the way it really did sound in Lamentations when people were lamenting, that people were just crying, but they were humming through snatches of things. It's interesting because I know that there's now, I don't know how long ago now, uh, maybe five, six ago, years ago, someone came up with this choral technique called singing your own voice. Well, you can see that that's not a very new thing. That's basically the way most people approach music and allowing, giving yourself permission to move away from the strict Western art music because even European music, I mean, if you've heard some of the beautiful Balkan music, it's just very beautiful music and it doesn't have to fall right into some certain box. Hmm. There's a question, are moaning songs sung at funerals? 
there is sun everywhere because they're not, it's the, remember there's no separation between sacred and secular. There's also no separation between what's sad and what's happy. Um, there are African funerals where people tell jokes and do skits, believe it or not, um, because there's, they just, it's, life is life uh, without life being separated into individual containers. That's great. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Williams. This has been just um, so wonderful the, the last two weeks, both of them. And uh, I know, and I'm not sure if others do, that you teach a course that you just taught a course this fall on um, African American music at the University of Minnesota. And I'm sure um, we all would love to be in your class and, and get a whole semester's worth. So thank you for doing your best to sort of boil some things down to um, just two hours for us. Well, um, and we hope, uh, hopefully there will be opportunities to, to collaborate again and hear from you again. Have you come work with the Westminster Choir it would be really fun. Although now you've got a Sunday gig, so that's yeah. hard. But we'll we'll gather a different day. Um, All right, we can do that. Yeah, I want that. To, to also just um, kind of plug our upcoming speakers that next week we have um, Philip Schultz joining us. Philip uh, works with Vocal Essence. He is teaching at St. Thomas University and just recently um, accepted a church job at Westwood Lutheran Church. Uh, Philip plans to talk about non-idiomatic compositions, so Black music other than spirituals, gospel, jazz, um, and uh, I think he's got some, some great composers lined up for us to learn about, uh, including some, uh, he says, two to three gospel transitions, transcriptions that are appropriate for every church choir, he says. Good. So uh, I think that will be fascinating. And then also, since, um, since he's on the call, I wanted to just introduce to you all Brendan Adams, who's the final speaker of our uh, five speakers. Um, and Brendan, maybe you can just say hi. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Dr. Yolanda. That was awesome. awesome. Brendan's from South Africa and um, is the leader of the group 2911, which I think several of you have heard or gotten to collaborate with. Um, and so Brendan will, will kind of be our final speaker, bring everything back uh, full circle, I think, in a way to come Indeed. back to Africa. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak more about um, the freedom music, uh, what the music happened, that happened during the apartheid and, uh, and why people did it and the sound that came out of it. So I'm looking forward to do that. Great, thank you. And uh, again, we'll post this recording as soon as it's ready um, so that you can share it with others. Invite other folks to join next week. And thank you again so much to Yolanda for a wonderful two weeks. Yay. Thank you all.